Our first game is starting, at least the draft for game number one is starting. We have our grand final at the end of the Storm Europe qualifier. Bubble Squad is going up against CDN. A lot of the teams are still traveling back from Dreamhack. This is why the lesser known teams have a pretty good chance to gather some points here in today's qualifier. And CDN is banning out a Jaina early on. Now that's a really interesting ban here. Because first of all, Jaina is not really that popular anymore. But with a ban on Jaina, there's still a couple of heroes that they can pick first. It's actually kind of interesting how drafting in general works. The team that picks first, bans first as well. So you can ban out a hero that you don't really want too much, but you don't want your opponent to have them. And then you have very good choices as the first one. Bubble Squad has been banning out ETC throughout the tournament, so they do that again. Kalthas is the first pick, not a surprise. Now Taranda for the Bubble Squad should probably be comboed off. Maybe with the Muradin here even. Muradin, Taranda could be a good uh, choice. They could also think about going into, uh, I guess, an Uther right now. Sonia is an option, but with the other heroes available, I'm not 100% certain if they are really going to commit to a Sonia this early in the draft. I feel like Taranda is definitely going to be one of the picks, and you can combo her off with that Muradin if you want to, and there's Muradin already, and it is Taranda. CDN has now very interesting choices. They can go into uh, the Uther. Uther alone is already great, but then they can combo that off with a potential Sonia. We've seen other teams go more into that Sonia plus Tassada because they are saying, hey, Uther is nice, but there's other healers that will do the trick as long as we have a Tassada to combo that Sonia off with. So they have the chance to do exactly that again and take one of those two picks. Uther in general is an amazing hero and I personally would be a little bit surprised if they would not go for it because he is just so strong with that Divine uh, Shield. Then again, if they don't want to play with him, if they say, hey, we're going to take a Tassadar here and then combo something else with Tassadar to get the heals out and the shields, then they are very likely to ban him out later. False Set is another hero that we oftentimes see. We've seen him a lot on Cursed Hollow, where he is probably he's probably the strongest on maps like Cursed Hollow, and I would say also on Sky Temple. But on Dragonshire, you can get a lot of mobility with False Set as well. And if you would try to control these shrines, he can be a huge and uh, like uh, he can be a great asset, just like jumping between lanes and making sure that you have an opportunity to uh, get all that. But they go into, as expected, Uther. The next pick, though, is a Zagara here for them. And Zagara on this map also is very, very good for the top lane. So you can use her and get a lot of vision into the map as well. They have played this before where we have seen them with great creep spread between the mid and the top lane. Zagara can easily solo lane. She gets great control and lane push on a lane, which helps to take these shrines. So that's an early commitment to her already. You can try and counteract that with the Sylvanas, which is a lot more popular these days than she was before. We have, on the other hand, now the ban for the Bubble Squad. And there could be a ban on Sonya. I mean, you have that Uther, so you always have to think about, okay, what can they throw up at the front line? And CDN has a chance to go into any kind of, there's the Sonya ban. I love it. Because I personally feel CDN could have gone into a Tyrael plus Sonya, a Johanna plus Sonya. No matter what, like having these two frontliners and therefore more damage as well. CDN has now the next ban, and with the setup that they are, that we are seeing for with Muradin and Tyrande, they go into that false dead ban. All right, we've been talking about false dead. Uh, he is one of the few heroes that he really has that global presence, right? And one of the things that they could do to still gain that is a Brightwing. But with a Tauranda, you can play her as a solo support too, so you don't have to. But they have options right now, which is pretty cool. What they would like to have, though, is even a bit more stun or burst damage. As the heroes, Vala and also Reyna are the ones that really come to mind at this point when we're talking about damage. Keep that Sylvanas in the back of your head still, because she has still a lot of pushing power that she can use against the Gara. And there's always the threat that CDN is now just saying, you know what? We're playing a solo tank, dropping a Sylvanas into the mix as well, and have massive pushing potential with the Zagara Sylvanas. It's more so a strategy that you oftentimes see on Tomb of the Spider Queen, but it can also be played on other maps, and Sylvanas is also in damage. Pretty solid. I mean, she is one of the heroes that you really have to respect there. So that's all of these things that Bubble Squad is currently thinking about. Like, could they go for Sylvanas? Should we take her? Are we going to go for Vala? Do we choose the Reyna here? Trying to get that single target damage in. Can we get some more stuns that we can combo off? And they go for the stuns. They go for Diablo. So Diablo plus Muradin plus Taranda usually equals a dead hero, at least if you play it, right? We saw CDN in the last the summer final having a bit of trouble with that Taranda and Diablo comp. The game still worked out very well for them. I mean, they were great in that summer final. But now apparently they're going to take a part of their own medicine, because this is looking very aggressive what Bubble Squad is playing. They are going to roam at the beginning of the game between the lanes. This is like a sniper comp that you're seeing right now. They're really trying to just like jump between lanes and get as many kills in as possible to take that lead. 
The time pool is far down, though, and there's a Morales, and that might be that they ran out of time here. So that is going to be quite interesting to see if that is actually like a legit pick that they have at this point because a Morales in this setup is something that I personally didn't really expect here. But if you run down your time pool like that, well, CDN with the last two picks here. I guess we're going to reveal later on if Morales is really going to be played or if that was just the draft. CDN for now with the last picks. I mean, we've been going over this a bit. A Johanna would be really good for the front line and a Tyriel as well. So Tyriel is being picked here. Are they going to commit to the Johanna as well or not? Arthurs is another option that Bubble Squad has mostly chosen. The other teams don't really rely on Arthurs as heavily as Bubble Squad. They've been using it in the quarterfinals and the semifinals. So I think this is the first game that I casted from Bubble Squad today where they did not go for an Arthurs. But it's not the most popular hero right now. He is being played though. So, Ethereal for the start, and what's going to be the next and the last choice for CDN? Is it going to be the Sylvanas? Will we see that second tank? Both of those would be pretty solid. And, yeah, of course, at this point, for them, it's also a question, what exactly did Bubble Squad really choose here? But so far, I haven't really seen any complaints, so it looks to me like that Morales might actually be legit. We're going to find out. She has been played a little bit more often, not only in the European scene when we saw her at Dreamhack, but also in the Chinese scene at Gold League, where once again we saw them play, uh, we saw Cloud9 actually play with it. And there's more damage, not the Sylvanas, but the Vala, which leaves Bubble Squad with the potential Raynor or the Sylvanas here for damage. And I guess then it's going to be revealed if that Lieutenant Morales is actually the hero that they want to go for. They're running down that time pool again, and there's the Raynor. Raynor has been taken, and well, guys, this is a pretty, this is a pretty solid start into our first game here. Game number one in the best of three series at the grand final of the end of the storm. Dragonshire is the map, and we're going to jump right into it. The first game in the best of three here at the end of the storm final, the qualifier final, of course, on the European server, where we have Bubble Squad going up against CDN, and to the left side of the map, it's the Bubble Squad with ETF on top playing Diablo, Atomic on Muradin, we have B Certified on Tassada today, Kursen on Taranda, and Lumpy is playing Reyna. So no Sergeant Morales for, or Lieutenant Morales for them. We have instead, it was a Tassada that was supposed to be picked there. Opponent's team agreed that it was alright to change that around, so apparently the time pool ran out, or the draft tool bucked a little bit, but Tassada is the confirmed pick for them. To the right side of the map, we are seeing CDN, the Polish team, with Ixide on Zagara. We have Goterra on Tyriel, Magnifico on Uther, Nikon on Kelthas, and Magu is playing Vala in this first game of the best of three series. Everybody's up at the top right now. They are just like trying to get a bit of damage against these towers, which is by now a pretty popular strategy, actually, to just try and burst them down as fast as they can. We have in the mid lane, on the other hand, is still that minion blocking that's going on, and the wave has already been eliminated. For now, of course, the early game is going to be dominated by the team in blue trying to get kills in with that very aggressive setup that they have, thanks to Tyranda, Diablo, and Muradin. They're going to try and just roam from lane to lane and get their kills in. And there's already a dash against Teriel, but Kursen missing the stun here just by a tiny bit, but that was enough for Goterra to get away on his Teriel. On level 1, of course, it is again the Soul Fields. We have Raynor going straight into his... Uh, season Marksman. They have a bit of different builds here for Reyna, and you can go for Give Me More on level 1 as well if you really want to. It's all a matter of how exactly your opponent is playing the game. Talking about how you're playing the game, these sniper comms that I've been announcing earlier are once again in action, and Vala is the first victim of that. Tyriel was able to get away a bit earlier, but Vala not so lucky, so she gets taken out. And again, the move straight into the mid lane where Uther is going to be the next target. The stun is missing, though. Curse not hitting the second stun, and therefore Uther getting away there. And the turnaround attempt against Atomic, but of course it's still a 3 versus 2 and therefore very little chance for the red team to take down one of the heroes that they're seeing from the bubble squad. It is the first game in the best of three series here at the tournament, and of course you are trying to get as many points as possible for the ranking. If you are claiming the first spot, you get quite a few of those. A kill against Reyna down at the bot lane. Four heroes actually jumping him here. So a very nice attempt on the side of CDN to equalize the kill score. The one kill against the kill. Up to the top, we have of course Zagara as the solo laner here. She's just absolutely incredible when it comes to her lane press. 
person. She's a real lane bully. And it's going to be very difficult for Tars to really push her back. But he has at least Oracle available, and that's going to be a nice tool to take these creep tumors down and deny her vision a bit, which is one of the reasons why the hero was taken in the first place. Nikken is trying to go for that Dragon Knight, but down to the bot lane, Atomic was able to claim one of the shrines. And uh, that's, of course, at least for them, a pretty cool move now so that they can make sure that no Dragon Knight is taken by CDN just yet. Multi shot built for Vala, but as we are seeing Diablo again with a Fire Devil on level 4 after he went straight into the Soul Feast on level 1. As expected, we have the Leeching Plasma for Tassada, who is very likely to go into Kala's Embrace on level 7. And Tyrande, after going for the Ranger's Mark on level 1 on the reduced cooldown, is adding the Protective Shield. Could have gone into a more damage focus build with the setup that they're currently running here, but they have now a very huge sustain thanks to Tassada and Tyrande. And again they jump in, and this time the follow-up stun hits, and they are about to eliminate Terror. Tyriel is down. He can dish out quite a bit of damage, and maybe Atomic? Nah, he's not locked down by Kel'Thuz or anybody. The camp also stolen away. Great job here on the side of the Bubble Squad. Very well done. They kill Tyriel, they steal the camp. They still have up at the top lane, be certified, doing a decent job against Excite on the Zagara. So, so far, it's the control on the Shrine that the red team has been gained. But still, Zagara wasn't able to drop any towers or something like that. So that's already a win for them. ETF on top and Kirsten, they are waiting on the other hand now. They want Zagara to move out, but she is already mounted and she is not going to move in too far. They know that there's nobody on the map right now and therefore Zagara knows they have to be somewhere. Maybe they're waiting for me. Already Roach is being dropped now and the rotation into the mid lane as both of the shrines are captured. ETF on top, waiting for an opportunity. He could try and dart in right now to get either Uther or Tyriel. They were aiming for Dragonite. They had both shrines under their control, but the one the top lane was taken immediately again by Zagara as the blue team is about to hit level 7 now. Reyna is still doing well down to the bot lane and putting some extra damage onto Maku, already dropping him to half health. Up here at the top, again the attempt to take down Zagara. Not successful at that though, but down here it is... Oh, that Storm Bolt, wow. Margu dodges the Storm Ball from Atomic. If he hits that, then they are able to take down Vala and maybe claim the Dragon Knight. But up to the top lane, we see a very different picture. This is actually the stun against Diablo, but he has enough hit points. Was attempting to just drop Tyrael on the other side of the wall. He moved back just in time. We've been talking about the damage potential a bit for Bubble Squad, and they adjusted the build on Tassadar. They didn't go for Carla's Embrace, but instead it's the static, uh, the static charge that has been taken. So a bit more damage for Tassadar, just to make sure that they have in the later stages of the game enough damage to really contest this. Atomic is zoning for Lumpy. Great body blocks here against these shots, but the, the last second hit with the composite arrows in Arsenal nearly took down Reyna regardless. But for now, he can escape. The blue team has both of these shrines. Curson! Ah, unfortunately for them, the shrine down to the bot lane was already channeled, so he doesn't get the opportunity to take it. Gravity Lapse misses. Curson gets away. If Nikon doesn't miss that Gravity Lapse, and I think we are seeing a kill against Taranda, but as is, she got away. Level 7 adjustments we have in this case now also taken for Diablo, Soul Steal over Battle Momentum. So that's another talent that he has just now been taken. You can really tell how aggressive this setup is currently for both of the teams, but especially Bubble Squad. We have just roaming, like roams happening throughout the entire game. Roam squads for the blue team, for the red team. They're all just like trying to get an early Dragonite by eliminating one of the heroes early on. The certified, everybody is focusing into the mid lane right now. Down to the bot lane, we have a bit of a fight as Tyriel had to move back. So this is the blue team claiming one of the shrines. Tyriel alone was not able to hold the shrine here. We are six minutes in, no Dragonite just yet. And the teams are doing whatever they can to maintain that lead. But in experience, is still very close. I mean, we talked level nine and a half versus just level nine. If Zagara puts a bit of effort in up at the top lane, she should be able to get a tower or two, and that would definitely help with the experience. Uh, but still, it's the blue team that will hit the level 10 faster. Question, of course, is can they really capitalize on it by gaining the Dragonite or not? Oh, kill at the top lane, actually, against Zagara. This time, Diablo and Toronto were able to move in and down to the bottom lane. Now, yeah, Lumpy and Atomic have eaten a lot of damage, but it's still level 10 versus level 9, and that could theoretically result in a Dragonite for the blue team if they get that shrine, and they're moving in. Terra wants to get another kill, and they're going straight for one against Tyriel, but the stun doesn't hit. Kursen was a bit too far off with his Lunar Flare to really secure that stun and therefore the potential kill against Tyriel. So the heroic abilities for them 
We have Archon even taken. We've been talking about that damage potential in the late game, and B Certified does not go for the Force Wall. Oh, and that Dragonite is captured as Vala is just barely not in range to get that damage in. Terror is zoned. Jumps in though with Earth Rune Smite. Able to escape here thanks to his mobility, but the Dragonite has still been captured by the Bubble Squad. So CDN needs to be extremely careful. They're starting to really focus their entire attention towards the Dragonite, and they should because two of the towers are already down, and that's another level that was secured on the side of the blue team and be certified is making his way up to the top lane now attempting of course to just push down even more towers and he's already there three heroes are meeting the rotation and we are having down to the bot lane a very lonely vala trying to make sure that she gets not only the experience from the wave but maybe even a bit of damage against the wall they're starting to rotate up to the top as well though and here's the second tower that is being eliminated now it's also of course the creep tumor that they can take out quite easily if you certify he's using his fire breath for it while the other heroes are starting to just like push their own AOE spells out now but we have terror getting in position they're starting to jump this and they're going in deep against Diablo but the punt already the Dragonite is the moving away and here is a very cool move once again the Divine Shield and Sanctification have already been used but it's Mark who is low on Vala and he dies Vala down the stun against Uther and he is of course helpless against this he was actually not in cooldown on his Divine Shield. He could have used it here, but didn't. So that was a bit unfortunate for him. Was stunned out completely by the entire setup that we're seeing for Bubble Squad. And they are doing an absolutely incredible job with this. They're starting to move in up at the top again. Soaking the rest of the lanes now too as Muradin went straight into the mid lane. But they want to have the first few structures here in the game. And now it's of course going to be a 5 versus 5 again as Uther comes back into the match. Five kills against one overall, and that just showcases how aggressive this setup is that we are seeing for the blue team. They will close head in, or like for any second now, head into the level 13, and that extra talent should give them another lead, which could result in them either stealing a few camps away, or depending on the announcement on the shrines, maybe even another Dragonite, because we still have an entire level that CDN has to catch up upon if they really want to fight on even talents then again. And already, camps are being taken. We have ETF on top in the mid lane, trying to first of all get of course rid of the creep tumors here, but also getting rid of the creep wave. Level 13 has a hit as the bruiser camp was uh, captured. And we now have, well, first of all, Prescience. There's also the uh, overflowing light for Taranda for the extra heals. Giant killer for Reyna, not really a big surprise there, and especially uh, Tyrell is not going to have a fun time later on in the game. Season Marksman plus Giant killer is pretty brutal, especially if you have focus attack 2 on your hero. Again, Firestorm, pretty standard build with the exception, of course, of the Soul Steel over Battle Momentum that we've mentioned early on when we've been talking about the level 7 talents. And, so, no shrines on the map, so at least that works for them, but the towers are now being attacked. Level 13 isn't quite ready yet for the red team, but it will be any second, but the blue team is capitalizing on their advantage as much as they can. Atomic with the body blocks against Go Terror, that with El Druin's might, he should have been able to jump away either way. So now we have an attack against another fort that has been taken. Shrines are up on the map right now, and the top one has been taken by Zagara, who is, of course, therefore not at the bot lane for the defense, as we see now Hyperion even being used. 13 versus 13, Imposing Will now. Last game we saw Angelic Absorption, this time it's the Imposing Will. A Shrink Ray 2, probably against Diablo if he starts to dash in. And Diablo is actually Gravity Lapse and attacked here, but Sanctification on the ground. A lot of damage already negated, but this is not looking too pretty for the red team because Magnifico on his Uther is nearly down, but so is also Muradin. And Reyna gets healed and moves away. ETF on top is low. Everybody's low. It's a kill against Diablo. One against Tyrael. Tyrael takes down two. Wow. Tyrael explodes and he takes down Muradin and Taranda. That was one of the best Tyrael explosions that I've seen in a long, long time. Of course, Diablo is already back to business thanks to his trade. But yeah, that was pretty sweet. This was a very satisfying uh, <laughs> move on Tyrael. He's like, all right, I died, but at least I got two kills out of that. He's going to be a happy panda. Margo was trying to capture the Dragonite, but well to the top lane. ETF on top is securing the shrine. And he's just rotating around. So they're trying to buy a bit of time for Muradin and Tirana to come back. Which could actually... Uh, nah, well... We have that shrine captured any second. The problem is that they are going for their camp down to the bot lane, so they can't really defend over here. But the blue team is still in a one-level lead. That's a pretty nice hit with that Aranda out, but it's not going to be a Dragonite for the red team. And level 16 any second, but the kill against Reyna. 
Great job. Really well done here. That was exactly what they needed. Another kill. Five kills against six now. But they're going into a five versus four and they are winning it. It was actually five, four versus four since Ixide wasn't with the team yet. It's a double kill for them since they have the level 16 talent. We're even seeing Rampage now taken, which is of course also brutal. That extra movement speed allows uh, Diablo to be an even bigger bully than he already is, just like dashing in and take them down. We have Stone Form for Muradin for the survivability. Also the Bullseye after Giant Killer. And with that level 16 talent, they just had the advantage in the fight either way. But of course, Zigara at the top lane still pushing this in. It's a pretty... They have 16 versus 16 talents now, but it's still 8 kills against 5, even with those recent triple kills that we saw in their favor. So now it's really just the job of the blue team to make sure that they are, like, staying in control. But we have... This is probably the most even that the game has been all game long, because now both of the teams have a huge opportunity to get something done since they are on even talents. Stun combo against Tyrael. Tyrael is dead again, and this time he's actually not going to get any damage out whatsoever. Pretty solid job here overall by the blue team. Uh, they screwed up a little bit with that one fight down to the bot lane where they lost a lot of their heroes, but in general they have very nice rotations on the map and they are also trying to really use the advantages that present themselves to them by going for another Dragonite now. They can rotate with everyone into the mid lane, the rest of the heroes to try and take that statue. They have very solid damage on Reyna in particular, but Diablo as you can see is on 20,000 damage as well. So that's pretty, pretty solid and that's exactly what we've been talking about earlier. Overall, we have more central damage on the side of the red team on their heroes, but it's just another Dragonite statue that has now been taken, and that of course just showcases how well the blue team is doing with their control of the objectives and the control of the map in general. One of the forts has been eliminated, and this is going to be the second one that falls here. So they are starting to go in for another kill. They have nine kills against five. Fort eliminated. They can move down to up to the top lane if they really want to get another one. Or they can just simply start to pressure the mid lane with a keep, which is probably what they should do and what they're currently doing here. Holy Ground has been used. Always a bit of the, the poke from Kel'thas. His zoning damage by Hyperion, of course. A nice building killer. And they're using that right away to zone the opponent out, push them back, and drop even more of the structures, or at least put a bit of damage on it. Atomic has another 27 seconds on the Dragonite, and he's starting to use that to move straight up to the top lane, and we already see them drop another tower. More experience for them. It's a one and a half level even experience that they now have. And Atomic is doing as much as he can with the Dragonite here. They are about to take that fort down too now, though. And again, the attempted stun combo against here, which didn't really work. Terra jumps in with a holy ground, zoning against Atomic, who did not use Avatar, but he used Stone Form. A bit of a mistake, in my opinion. And now he might pay the price for it. But they have also, yes, Muradin is about to fall, and he's taken down. Lightning Breath, on the other hand, used to zone everybody else out. And BTF on top doing a lot of damage with that. The Maw, on the other hand, can they capitalize on it? It looks like they're trying to. And it's a kill against Diablo, who's down for now an entire minute. But Kel'thas dies, and just look at these hit point pools. They steal the camp, and that was a solid effort. But Ixide and Utha, together with Vala, they all have to rotate away. Now, as I said, a bit of a mistake here by Mirrodin. Normally, if you try to go for your stone form, you usually go into Avatar first, and then you hit stone form because it's based on your max HP. So if you hit stone, if you hit Avatar first, you heal a bit more than that, and your survivability is greatly increased. In this case, he didn't really want to commit to the heroic ability. Probably, like in voice, they were talking about how much they really wanted to commit to the fight, and I guess the call was made that they're trying to disengage. And Mirrodin thought that with stone form alone, he would be able to get away there. Turned out that he was. So he did not want to use that cooldown on Avatar, but then in the end it turned out that Stone Form alone is not enough for him to just get away from this position. So he used it afterwards, but he didn't really get that combo potential, and that was the biggest problem that they had in this situation. So without that, if he uses both of them at the same time, then it's of course a much better spot for him to be in, and they, they could have been able to just get away from this one. As is though, we still have 10 kills versus 5, and we have that lead for the blue team. Bubble Squad is on level 19. Roughly a 19 and a half, so they are one level ahead and will hit those level 20s earlier. We don't have uh, another Dragonite on the map announced yet. We have also, when it comes to the abilities, um, still pretty solid talents here. Focus, of course, on that damage on the side of Diablo with the Rampage, with the Firestorm. We've been talking about that a bit. Level 16 gave us Brute Expansion on the side of Zagara. We saw the Holy Ground already in action. Benediction, Arcane Barrier. And once again for Vala, the move into Blood for Blood. Looking at the damage here overall, you can really tell that with 32,000, Diablo is at a very solid amount. I mean, he has nearly as much damage as Reyna. That's pretty incredible. 
40,000 on Zagara, on Kelthas, and on Vala. So there's very solid damage that they've been able to fish out overall. But when it comes to the kills and just like the entire match, then it's still the blue team that is calling the shots here. They have great sustain with a Tassada Tirana combo, and they have also, of course, very difficult to kill frontliners. Diablo is a little bit weaker in the late game, but overall, together with Muradin, he's building a great front line here, but already the attempt for another kill, and they're starting to move in. Lumpy is down, Reyna is dead, and that's a lot of damage that they have here that is just suddenly missing, and now Muradin has to move away. These kills, these, like, like, these small attempts to really drop a target early on in these fights, this is exactly what the red team needs to go for right now, because we have the level 20 abilities now, and that means Hellstorm now taken. We, of course, have Reyna with the Nexus Frenzy, even more damage put out by him, and Storm Shields, Twilight Archon, great Great talents overall. The damage output of three of these heroics is absolutely insane. At the same time, when you're going for the top lane right now, you're seeing that they are going to try and get the Dragonite. They are still in a 5 versus 4 position, so it's one of the moves that they can try. They can try and capitalize on it, even though they don't have the level 20 talent, if they get a good fight here, or if they like get one of these heroes. But it's not going to be easy, since that 20 talent is, of course, a pretty big deal. We have so much damage. That Twilight Arc alone is amazing. Hellstorm is great. And once again, they're jumping in. Terra was trying to zone out Diablo with the Holy Ground. Didn't get that done. Stun combo but very early Divine Shield being used here. Better safe than sorry. And they're going for Atomic. Great more on the back line, isolating them. Hellstorm, look at the damage thanks to Hellstorm. Just look at how much damage Diablo can push out. Just to give you a bit of an idea, he is at 43,000 now. He currently overtook Reyna. He is the highest damage dealer on their team. This is one of the big, uh, like, this is one of the big things why you would choose Diablo in such a setup. Why he's suddenly so popular once again. But playing him as a solo tank is a pretty bad idea, normally. There are, of course, a couple of compositions where you can pull that off. But we have seen a few Diablo solo plays. And normally, in the early game, it works out really well for you. And you're looking super strong. But then later on, you get dumpstered on. Dragonite, not captured. Tyrion's at the bot lane. That means that he's missing up at the top here. Vengeance for Vala, not going into a bolt of the storm, but we saw at least two heroes go for the mobility talent. Zagara plus Kalthas. Mobility and survivability is everything on those two. And the redemption, of course, on Uther with a hardened shield for Gotera. <laughs> Fight about to start, and zoning already. Stun into stun. Zagara blinks away in the last second. Diablo is about to die already. We are having Hyperion committed. Diablo gets away. Terra barely escaping the range here. He's thinking about jumping in again, and he's already doing that. Atomic aims for Tyrael, but hits Vala instead, and they are going for the Shrine. They are going to get this one. And that, of course, also negates the threat of the Dragonite being captured by the opponent's team again. And let's just face it. The next Dragonite is going to mean keep if the blue team is able to capture it. With all of the forts still on the map, there's a chance that the blue team and the bubble squad might actually survive a Dragonite and not lose a keep there. But once again, we have the fight happening over there in the bot lane, and Muradin is going straight for Uther. The Maw doesn't hit anybody this time, and that's a problem. Excite replacing or misplacing that a little bit. Divine Shield is saving Tyrael, but in comes Muradin again. The stun is hitting Tyrael and Zagara, who got shielded, but that's the kill that they've been waiting for. One kill already, and the Hellstorm for Diablo pushing so much damage on them, but not eliminating anybody. Zagara barely survived here, and they are going for the Dragonite. I actually think they could have moved in against the keep. With everybody this low, they could have tried to snipe the keep first, but they want to go for the Dragonite instead. So, at this point, be certified aims for it, but here comes the Gravity Lapse. They're trying to buy some time for Tyrael to come back once, twice, zoning that out as much as possible, and we have Ixite up at the top lane getting the Shrine. As I said, I think it would have been a better choice for them to go for the keep uh, directly since everybody was nearly down. The stun is missing. Kirsten does not hit the stun. Neither does Muradin, who jumped in here and was trying to put the damage on. But yeah, because of that, the keep is still there. 14 seconds on Tyrael, though, so the blue team, Bubble Squad, is still going to try and get the Dragonite. And with Reyna now capturing the top lane, Shrine, they have a good chance of making that happen. Phoenix for the zoning, but already Muradin is back, and this is a very good position for these to fight to get that Dragonite once the Phoenix is done. And Phoenix duration is over. Dragonite has been captured. 55,000 damage on the Diablo. Wow. 73,000, by the way, on the side of Zagara and 72,000 Kalthas. So the damage dealers here, of course, with absolutely incredible numbers. But for a tank, Diablo is definitely doing a lot. B-Certified is dancing in the mid lane. 
All right, not really taunting the opponent's team. The reason is quite simple. Tyrande was low on mana and HP, so they send her back to uh, just ready up, and therefore they had to uh, waste a bit of time in the mid lane. It's better safe than sorry. You don't really want to rush in with the Dragonite and get bursted down. That's actually one of the problems that a lot of people have in Hero League and in quick matches, that they do that. You need to wait for your team to really move in together with you so that you get the most value out of the Dragonite. And they are trying to get the first keep here. They would love to take the one down at the bot lane as well. Already, Shadier Stalk has been used, is in cooldown. A bit of extra heals and, of course, the potential to attack here. Go Terrace at the front. He's uh, taking a lot of damage here, but still, can well up. Had the cooldown ready. First keep is down and be certified is already starting to move in to drop the wave first and then move in with the rest of it so here we go there's the potential of a punt but nope it's instead just another fort or another keeper there in the form and they are easily going to take this one Dragon Knight does extra damage against the structures, which is one of the reasons why you never want to fight with him against heroes. You really want to put the damage against structures. And are they going to get that kill here? Tyrael is so low. Hyperion is used. Lumpy is taking a lot of damage, but Vala is taking more. She is down. Terror is escaping. Gets punted for a second there. But yep, three heroes, four are still alive. Ixide is moving in from the side, and everybody is just like trying to get another kill in there. Ixide is down. He moved in a bit too far. That's a double kill. Two of the keeps are down, and it looks like the bubble squad is attempting to end the game. If they can take Nikon down, that would be all they need to do. But he blinks away in the last second. Terror, on the other hand, is not able to escape, and he is taken down, and now they are starting to focus on the core. GG already called as Bubble Squad is aiming to finish the game. 20% 10, and this is game. Game number one ending in favor of Bubble Squad. They take the lead in the series here at the grand final of the End of the Storm Europe Qualifier. All right, everybody, game number two is starting, or the draft is starting, and wow, they are really starting to ban out heroes fast. Bubble Squad apparently with a bit of hate on Tyrael here on Battlefield of Eternity. The map choice for CDN, who are down in the series now. We have Taranda being picked for CDN, or banned out, I should say, with a potential Kel'thas first for Bubble Squad, I suppose. That's the chance that they have right now, unless they want to go into something like ETC and Muradin, or split the two of them at least, then they might go for a bit of a different start into that draft now. CDN has the next two picks. Uh, the draft tool is lagging behind a little bit, but we should see that first pick on the side of Bubble Squad any second now. So if it's not the Kalthas, and I suppose it's either going to be ETC or like Uther to split the two of them up, but the Kalthas is still a very likely scenario here. Battlefield of Eternity is, as already mentioned, the first map. There it is. We have Kalthas indeed as the first one, so CDN has a chance to go into Uther plus ETC, or at least get one of the two here. I highly doubt that they're going to allow Bubble Squad to get uh, both of them, so they're going to pick one of them. Falstad is taken first. They had a very high focus on the hero already in most of the games so far that we casted today, and I suppose with that we could see them go either into the ETC now or into the Uther. I would personally be a little bit surprised if they let both of them go now, because Bubble Squad could try to capitalize on that with picking the two of them up and then have a very solid composition to get Kalthas with the extra damage in here. Battlefield of Eternity is our second map. We have Bubble Squad currently in the lead with a 1-0 after they had a very solid performance on our first map, which was Dragonshire, of course. So CDN running down that time pool already of theirs. And, well, right now, it's looking a little bit like they are hesitant of what they should pick here. I mean, if you don't go into Uther or ETC, you have a lot of uh, good options of what would be alternatives. I mean, Muradin is a tank that a lot of people have been focusing on highly, and they go into a Tassada instead. Now, that's an interesting move now, because that allows Bubble Squad to go into that ETC comp, and I'm personally very, very curious if they use that opportunity. There are other heroes that you can take. We've been talking about that potential to go into the Muradin early on. With the Tassadar already taken on the side of CDN, they're probably looking towards a Sonya if they're able to get that through the draft. Either way, Tassadar is going to be a very strong uh, hero to be considered here, but that gives them a few options. But Bubble Squad still has that opportunity to go into that Mosh Pit Divine Shield combo. They pick Muradin away, though. Are they going to use the Uther at least here for that setup, or are they going to let that go as well? Pretty interesting draft if you think about it. I mean, in most of the drafts that we've seen in the past few days, it was really just like this focus on make sure that ETC does not get an Uther support. Make sure that your opponent does not get either one of them, and of course, the worst case scenario, both of them. And now Babel Squad has, for the first time in a long time, in a lot of the drafts that we have here, the opportunity to get them and decides against it. 
but they have nice interrupts already. As long as they make sure that CDN doesn't get both, they should be able to even interrupt an ETC Mosh Pit if ETC is being picked by CTN. Uh, by CDN. But for now, it could be that Uther that they are going to go for. But we've already been talking about that a bit. Uther is amazing, especially with certain heroes. But there's also uh, a couple of alternatives that you have right now that are very, very strong. So Bubble Squad has taken their pick. We're going to see that any second now. The draft tool today is a bit slow to react. CDN is going for the next span. It's a little bit difficult to analyze that if you don't know what was picked just now. But overall, I mean, yeah. It's actually more or less impossible to really de determine what is being, uh, what is going to be banned out now, or what the options are. Uh, the time pool is actually dropping for both of the teams here as well, so yeah, that tool is a bit weird now. Zagara again! They really have that massive Zagara focus for B-Certified. He loves that hero and he's using that again. Uther is now banned out as a consequence because CDN doesn't really want to rely upon him. And he doesn't want to give Uther, they don't want to give Uther to the opponent's team. So uh, we have the ban for Bubble Squad, and I mean, at this point, I would ban out, I would ban out Sonya. Sonya seems like a very solid ban here. Sonya or ETC, the two of them are scary. Uther is banned out though, so that mosh pit into a Divine Shield is not going to happen. You have a Maw, you have a stun on Muradin, and you have Gravity Lapse. They ban out ETC. I personally still think that the better option would have been a Sonya, which I think is going to be picked now by the Polish team, by CDN. ETC, the Mosh Pit is dangerous, it's very scary, it's a huge, huge deal when it lands properly, but they already have a, like a fair amount of stuns and they're probably going to add even more, so they could have interrupted that. Same is of course also true for Sonya, but Sonya, if she's going to be picked, will have that support of Tassada and potentially of a Brightwing or maybe a Charism, depending on what exactly CDN is going to pick here. Brightwing would for Battlefield of Eternity be a very solid hero, especially for the European meta, but we have a Charism instead, again, the Divine Palm here. So, is it going to be the Sonya? She would be really good and you could add another frontliner then next to her. But if they want to play her, they should probably take her right now. That would probably be the best for this point. Bubble Squad, they kind of need another tank too if they don't want to play. Well, they can actually play Muradin as a solo tank, let's be honest here. Muradin is the best solo tank that is currently in the game if you want to play him. So, they can do that. And uh, they can also try to combo something off with Zagara. And the more, even with an Apocalypse, has been very popular in the past. We have seen a few uh, Diablo players use Apocalypse. It's still Lightning Breath that most people are going to go for. A Jaina is instead being used. Now that's an interesting touch here. No Sonya, but a Jaina instead. Now that of course helps you to burst in a bit more damage. And it's cool for to go for the uh, Immortal. But still, like that is interesting. I'm not sure if I'm really liking this combo too much, to be honest. Bubble Squad has now, for my liking, way too many opportunities to really screw with that. They could pick up a Sonya as well if they wanted to. They so far don't really have a big healer here, and we're probably thinking along a completely different line of heroes to pick now. But Sonya, together with the Muradin, is pretty solid with the Kel'thas as well. Doesn't combo as well with that Zegara as he could, but... They have a f lot of options. I mean, Arthas is something that Bubble Squad has been using over and over again. They love to use that with the Zagara. They've played him on Battlefield of Eternity. They could use him again here. Use that more. Drop that Howling Blast. Get the Piercing Bolt in from Muradin. Lock these heroes down as much as you can. And then just like use that Arthas to the front and the survivability. Malfurion for the root into Zagara more has been chosen. They don't want to go into a Brightwing here. Brightwing would have been a choice for CDN more so, I feel, with that Hasada. And there is that Arthur that I just mentioned. CDN, Johanna, could be their weapon of choice. We've actually seen a few teams even go into an Anubarak solo, which was a bit surprising to see that. But right now we have an opportunity. Well, solo together with the Sonya. Let's be honest here. But yeah, look, going for uh, Johanna might be the best move at this point. I mean, there are other tanks out there, but I really feel that Johanna right now with the setup that they're running, he would probably be their best option. I'm a little bit afraid that they are trying to go into something like a solo Diablo because I feel that would be a disaster then in the long run. And the early game is usually quite strong because you get the burst damage from Jaina and then you have also Tassada. But they go for a Stitches! All right, I like that. So uh, Stitches with a hook, then uh, Jaina with the potential to just like drop that quick Blizzard and false that, depending on his positioning, can even Mighty Gust the opponents away. I, I like it in the sense that it's cool. But to be honest with you, just looking at that setup, I feel like Bubble Squad has a massive lead here when it comes to the draft alone. CDN is going for a bit of a surprise build, I want to say, that can work out if you get like these monster hooks in, then it can be great. 
but just looking at this setup, we have a lot of sustain on the side of Bubble Squad. We have them with that Zagara into Roots, into Howling Blast, into Muradin, Piercing Bolt, combo potential with the Gravity Labs and all that damage. Like, I like Bubble Squad setup for this map a lot. And Stitches, of course, can be quite nice here because when you fight for the Immortal, he has a lot of, like, there is a huge potential that he's going to hit one of these hooks. But still, the setup that we're seeing right now for Bubble Squad, in my personal opinion, is a bit stronger. And I am very interested to see if CDN can can really make that setup with Stitches work, especially since they don't have a stun. I mean, they are not running a single stun here that they could really use. One of the cool things about this, though, and I have to highlight it again, is that we could see on Karazim the seven-sided strike, and if Stitches hooks the target and you get the Blizzard and the seven-sided strike into play, and that usually allows you to burst a target away immediately, and I think that's the thought process that we're going to see here. So Stitches hook into seven-sided strike on the isolated target and the Blizzard on Jaina. That can work, it can give you the lead, but if it comes to a team fight with a five versus five, Bubble Squad is going to annihilate them. So CDN has to play a very passive game and make sure that they rely heavily on those hooks. And we're going to find out right now if that's going to work. Game number two, ladies and gentlemen, has just now started. And we have to the left side the Bubble Squad with a 1-0 lead in the best of three series. They are going up against the CDN. And as you can see, we have Muradin uh, played by ETF on top to the left side. B-Certified is playing Zagara. Atomic currently on Arthurs, Kursen on Malfurion and Lumpy on Kel'Thuz. To the right side of the map, CDN down one game in the best of three series here at the European final of the end of the Storm qualifier. Nikken on Jaina for them. Um, I, I <laughs> Xide on Tacita. Go Terra on Stitches, Magnifico on Karazim, and Magu on Falstead. Now we've been going over this in the draft already quite a bit. The setup that we're seeing currently for CDN is of course heavily reliant on Stitches, who went, by the way, as a level 1 talent into the Dampen Magic, which is already an interesting talent to take at this point, but if you're up against that Kalfos, I mean, I don't really blame him. So they are going into that stun. There's already the kill, potentially, against B Certified, and they get it. They take him down. Great first blood here for CDN. Their setup, once that we leave the early game and we start with the Auric abilities, is going to rely so heavily on these stitches hook. You can't even imagine how desperately they, they need good hooks. What they are going to try to do most likely is use the seven-sided strike on Karazim, just hook a target, seven-sided strike it immediately and drop the damage with Jaina on the Blizzard and try to take it down. If they end up in a five versus five battle after level 10, I really feel that they don't stand a chance in the world against the setup that we're seeing from their opponent. There's way too much CC and chains that we could see here. But then again, Stitches on this map when the Immortal fights start is a very solid hero that can do a whole lot of work because there's not really too much to obstruct the uh, Stitches hooks. I mean, we have the Roaches and Zagara and also the potential Hydra list. So that's definitely something that we somehow has to deal with. But as long as he gets those hooks in, they should be able to at least put a lot of damage on those. So for now, <laughs> Lumpy apparently nearly caught by a hook there. We have Fall set at the bot lane going up against Atomic. We have a lot of talents that are based on either Regeneration Master or even Season Marksman for Falstead. We have a double Conjurer's Pursuit for Tacita and Jaina. Could have seen something like the uh, Mana Storm on level 1 for Tacita. But besides that, we're also seeing uh, Tacita in this case most likely going ahead at least a few of his shield talents, but Mental Acuity could still be the level 4 talent that they rely upon. They have a Charism for the extra heal, so they don't necessarily need to go into the Leeching Plasma. Vision on this map is incredibly important. And already we have the move-in by Atomic, and they're going for Stitches. There is a Gravity Lapse as well, and all these stuns are, of course, what we've been talking about earlier. Tacita is keeping Stitches alive. Atomic, on the other hand, is moving a bit too far out. Now they're a bit too aggressive this early on. This early in the game, I mean, they still have a decent amount of chain, but what we have on the side of their opponent's team is still pretty strong. So I would be, I would wait a little bit longer until I'm going in this aggressively. Go Terra, of course, as the only frontliner for Team CDN. Needs to be a bit careful here. We have currently down here into the, oh, at the first model, blue model, losing a fair amount of hit points already. And with that slight lead in experience that we're seeing for the red team, they have the earlier level four, and that allows them to go straight on stitches into to the Amplified Healing. There's the Leeching Plasma still. No Mental Acuity for Vision. And we have also now the focus on the Red Immortal who's going to take the first one. It looks like it might be CDN claiming this. Who has the most burst? And it is... 
Oh, wow, that was close. The blue immortal survives with just barely any hit points left whatsoever. So we are seeing the um, bubble squad with the first objective of the game. They went in terms of talents on the Netherwind on level 4 for Kalthas, obviously. They're having very, very standard talents at this point. It's interesting to see that Stitches didn't actually even go for his talent on level 1 where he gets the higher hit point pool than later on in the game. So no give me more. Uh, so this is actually like pretty cool because you don't see Dampen Magic too often. It's a pretty great talent actually, but it's just uh, not used all that often because other talents are yeah, supposed to they're like perceived to be a little bit better than it, especially when Stitches has this massive, massive hit point pool then. The bot lane has an oh, nice root, but is Jaina really gonna die here? No, she's not. She wells up and moves back, and Excite was able to just draw, throw out another shield. Level 6 for both of the teams very soon now. Loon's Graves from Malfurion is gonna make it so much easier for him to really hit these roots, since it, of course, increases the radius of all the basic abilities that are being used by Malfurion, and that includes the roots themselves. So he is going to stay in the back line as safe as possible and trying to get that in. Rampant growth is something that we occasionally see on level 4, which is now a bit better than it was in the past. Already a fair amount of creep tumors that have been used. ETF on top actually jumping into the bush here, hoping for a potential stun and then maybe a follow-up kill. But so far we had two kills for the red team. Two against zero. Camp is being taken over here. Oh, not just yet. Magnifico, there's the hook against Kirsten. He's moving away. The camp might actually be stolen here. Nice gravity lapse against Falstad, who dies. Up at the top, we still have that fight here. That fight is still happening. And Zagara moves in. They get the kill against Skelta. Oh, Karasim is down. The hook against Zagara. Muradin survives. God knows how. And Doterra is now moving away. A double kill against them. Very, very very well done. God, I like this game already. That was fun. We just saw oh, two heroes nearly die. I mean, Kirsten gets hooked, Muradin nearly dies. They turn around, drop false there, they drop Karasim. That was very well done. We have even the edit, the endless creep, like edit vision for Zagara, trying to just make sure that she is able to put as much creep tumors on the map as humanly possible. And also then, of course, attempting to make sure that they get the vision on the map. And if you look at the minimap, you can already tell that most of the middle is covered in creep, and therefore it's great vision to determine the movements of the red team. And they are starting to get into position here, whereas we see the camp taken out to the left side. That has been taken already. Move down to the bot lane on the other hand, and Arthur's is dead. Arthur's taken down. That's exact. How can Arthur's die here? I'm really not quite sure exactly that happens. You have creep tumors in the mid lane. You see the entire team rotate down to you, and apparently he just wasn't fast enough to move away. So he dies. Must have not looked at the minimap at that point in the time and not realized how big that threat was. So it's an early kill into the immortal fight for the red team. And CDN, therefore, with a 5 win score situation for a little bit. But nice chains against Terror, who has to move back now. And Arthur's is on his way back into the fight. We have Enduring Growth taking on Malfurion on level 7. We have Frost bitten for Jaina. And especially Stitches is already getting really low. He took Tenderizer as his talent. Carla's Embrace as the level 7 for Tasta for the pre heals. I still expect that we're going to see the seven-sided strike for Karazim, by the way, as we're talking about it. But let's see who's going to take this immortal now. This is, of course, a big fight. And keep also that camp down here in mind. This is a huge camp right now. Securing this early and nobody dealing with it just yet, this is potentially going to drop a fort. It's one of the most vicious bruiser camps that you can potentially get in Heroes of the Storm. There's already the halftime show straight in the middle. And, of course, they're trying to go for the Immortal again. Falstad had to move down, though. He's taking care of the camp. The camp is gone. And now everybody is focusing on the Red Immortal. Gotero is waiting for another opportunity to get a hook in. And he gets the one against Kalthas. The Immortal helps with a stun. And that's the snipe that they needed. Well done here. Great hook so far by Terror. As mentioned before, they need to rely on these hooks. In a 5 versus 5 setup, it's going to be very tricky for them to really just win these battles. Also because we have two such impressive front laners on the side of the opponent's team, on the side of the bubble squad with Arthur's and with Muradin. But if you land hooks like this, then you are in a great spot to uh, get a kill early on in the fight. Talking about kills, Falstead is flying away here in the last second. At the top lane, on the other hand, the Immortal is nearly bursted down, but it is Jaina that dies first, and now Karazim is going to fall as well. They might get the Immortal, but they are losing a lot of heroes to make it happen. Here comes the kill against the Immortal, but that also concludes the end of Falstead, and Tassada die too. It's a quad kill. They get the Immortal, but they lose four heroes, and there's the level 10s now on the side of the Bubble Squad, and that leaves them with more 
We have Tranquility, Mirrored in with the Avatar, Army of the Dead, and the Phoenix has been chosen. They get a massive, massive lead out of this, and I'm really sure that they are happily trading this for Nimodo on the opponent's side, because they can burst this down easily. There's absolutely no problem whatsoever, since the entire red team has to rotate over. They don't even have the heroics. So that this win, or this fight, was a great win for them. Really well done here. Immortal is about to die, and now they can just like try and push this into the right side, but level 10s are also hitting very, very soon now for CDM. And they have Goterra up at the top lane. He's very, very crucial for their team fights, as we said. Everybody else is moving down to the bot lane already. Level 10s have now been hit, and they go for the 7 side of strike. I would have been shocked to see a Divine Palm here. We have Pudric Bile taken, there's also the Ring of Frost, and we have Force Wall plus Mighty Gust. A lot of really placement talents, a lot of positioning talents that you have now. And once again, a hook target is very, very likely to die unless, of course, it is a Muradin that is jumping away or, yeah. But this is, is very, very dangerous. You need to really watch your positioning if you're playing on the side of the bubble squad at this point because you already know that Stitches is going to try and hook, especially at the back line. Lumpy in particular needs to be super careful where he is. And we are seeing the tanks already starting to zone a little bit at the front there. But if they are able to push into the opponent, then they can make a lot of happen there. There is the immediate hook. It's hitting, but look at all those lockdowns. And the Maw is hitting as well. Where is that Howling Glass? It hits and it hits hard and it goes straight for Tacita. He's down. Ring of Frost is hitting so much. A Puric Ball has been used. Kelfas is dead as well, but Stitches dies. And they have the push again. They're moving in. All of their rogue abilities have been activated here, except for the Force Wall, who's already back in cooldown. And once again, Again, they're just like trying to get another kill. There is the attempt for Nick and Stun with a hit first and then the follow-up. Down goes Jaina. Great play here on the side of ETF on top. It was really well done. Muradin in avatar form has a mini stun on his auto attacks and he could have used that storm bolt immediately but he decided against it. He walked in, he auto attacked Jaina, mini stunned her and that small moment in time was enough for him to really hit that storm bolt and make sure that Jaina was not able to move away. So a lot of patience in that moment and very well played here and that gives them now kill number nine in the game. Nine kills against five, a very solid leading experience. The immortals are on the map again. We have the deep push up at the top lane thanks to Kalthas and Muradin and they're starting to roam around once more with the level 13 talent now finally ready for the blue team. The bubble squad has now double spell shield of course they also have in this case the ice block and we're seeing the chain bombs. Kalthas has to wait a bit longer until he's finally safe with that arcade barrier but good lockdown already against Terror. He's slowed down as well. Here's the gravity lapse and they're going for stitches that's exactly what we've been talking during the draft. They are relying on these hooks. They can't engage in two fights, especially not when they are one talent down. So at this point, we're seeing them moving over into the middle of the map again for the next Immortal and of course Bubble Squad with that two level lead. One and a half level lead, they are in a magnificent position. All these spell shields help heroes like Zagara to stay alive against the seven-sided strike, against also the fraud, like the blizzard in general. And if a Zagara really commits to a spell shield, then you already see how much danger is really coming from the opponent's composition because normally Zagara players are just like so eager to go straight into these brute expansion talents on level, on level 30. Kalthas too far out, and there's the attack right away. Muradin has to jump away nearly the hook against Arthas here. And that was actually a bit of a problem. Kalthas dying again, Lumpy getting eliminated, and they were just too greedy. They could have gone for the Immortal, they're still attempting to do that, and they have it very low, but if they lose now another hero, that would be a massive problem. And that's a great force wall that we're seeing. Atomic is zoned out, needs to use a rogue ability, goes for the Army of the Dead, they rescue themselves towards the bot lane, where we have, of course, the Immortal helping them out as well with these stuns, and false dead. Wow, Blizzard not hitting anybody. False dead was nearly going down, but they retreated just in time. Now Kalthas is on his way back, is starting to move in again. Level 13 talents are still not ready, and Zagara is already moving around the teams, trying to go to the top lane to burst down the Immortal, and they're going to get this objective easily. Job well done here. Level 13, any second now. And that will allow them, at least for now, to fight on even talents. So here we have them. Relentless, four stitches, double relentless, of course, as Charism takes the same talent. And again, Lumpy is getting hooked again. He just came back. He was dead a second ago, and now he dies once more. His positioning is going to be crucial, and he has to really work on this. He's very, very unlucky with the positioning here. Should always move through the minion wave, make sure that these hooks can't hit 
him. Stitches is always going to try to go for him, and he died several times now. Icy Veins taken, and another great hook, this time against Malfurion. Uses, nice, I love it, Tranquility, and then straight into his Ice Block, as he should. Kursen is still taken out, though, and they are going for an incredible fight here. The red team is seeing an opportunity with them isolating Kalthas this early. They're getting their kills now. Arthas is down, so is Zagara, and they're going for another kill against ETF on top on Muradin. He's trying to jump away, and he's barely getting it, but there comes the dash. But Muradin is safe, at least for now. That's a very interesting... Oh, the Storm Ball doesn't hit! Oh, that was so close! ETF on top, probably a little bit unhappy with himself at this point. But we have the top lane Immortal, of course, going through the entire key forward. Keep that in mind. I mean, that's a lot of kills that we just saw against the blue team. But, of course, that Immortal was pushing through the, during the entire time. And he has a great gravity lapse, and he is going to die, isn't he? ETF on top should be able to take him down, and that's exactly what happens here. Good kill against Karazim. By the way, top lane, Immortal went through the entire wall. So all those kills looked really impressive for the red team. But it bought a lot of time for the blue team to get the structures down up at the top. And they are currently close to level, yeah, to level 16. By the way, we're going to look at the talents in a second. But look at the kill count here. Four deaths on, Kara on uh, Kalthas already. And he really, really needs to make sure that that doesn't continue throughout the game. Because as the death timer numbers increase, it's going to be really brutal for them if they lose Kalthas this early in the fight. He's one of the biggest damage dealers for them, and he needs to deliver. If he doesn't, then they are going to run in quite a bit of trouble. But now they have the advantage of having the Arcane Barrier, and that is worth so much for Kalthas. He finally has an option to really stay alive here. Also, a stone skin being used, stone form, great talents, Malfurion with a hardened focus for the reduction on the cooldowns, and then he gets even more heals out there, and even more roots, and they are going to try and start to push this in. 16 talents aren't ready yet for their opponent, but they have to move to the top lane to defend against the Bruiser camp that was taken a little bit earlier by CDN. The Polish team is doing really well there. But so far, they have 10 kills. They just don't have an opportunity to really go for the Immortal and maybe get a bit more out of this. Look at the creep spread once again. Be certified really trying to make sure that they have as much vision on the map as possible. Here's again an attack. Where's that hook? They're trying to go for it. Already zoning that out. 16 versus 16 talents. More has been used. Camp has been gotten. But now we are going straight for Arthas again. But he's already going straight for Stitches. They have the army of the dead in point and Terra is about to die here. Not even all of the heroics have been taken. The four takes him down. Stitches is dead. Mirrodin jumps in. Is trying to go for the Stormbolt here against Margu. Doesn't hit it against Falstead in this case. We have Fishing Hook now taken. We're also seeing the Circle of Life. We have Hammer Time, which is a great talent. Dimensional Warp and the Numbing Blast. But it's again another potential to take down a hero like Tazadan. There's the Stormbolt. They're going straight for it. Prescience activated and he is forced back. But the Immortal is helpless now. Stitches is not with him. He's the only tank for the team, and therefore they can't do anything about this now. 17 versus 16, and the Immortal is at least going to get to half health before Stitches is back. Another 7 seconds. Ixide is trying to just like use a few storms for zoning potential here, but that's of course not really enough. Once again, we're seeing them moving in here in the mid lane. There's the fight for the two Immortals, and the rotation couldn't be any better for the blue team. They can already try to burst this one's down. Stitches is now in his way. Keep these hooks in mind. This is like one of those money hooks that you need to get, but they're not even trying to. They are just accepting that they're going to lose the objective. They don't move in for the hook. They could have used the seven-sided strike. Everybody moving away. They want to have full mana for this attack, because this one is a really, really big one. Nearly full shields on the Immortal, and that's the time when we are going to see the Bubble Squad try to go at least for a keep. They need to drop a keep here. They really need to try and make this happen, and they're already starting to move in down at the bot lane, trying to attempt to go for a kill on the keep at this point, and it looks very, very good that that might happen. 17 minutes in, the Immortals, they are not really totally crazy at this point, but they are already very, very strong, and that Immortal is starting to move in. The hook, though! Seven-sided strike, and nothing else has been used here, though. No follow-up, and this is now the damage potential against Goterra. Even with the Relentless, he has taken a lot of damage, and guess what Falsa does have relentless. He's actually just trying to rush away after he got hit by that nether, nether thingy by the gravity lapse. 
It's the dead keep, and it could be more than that. Be certified is being attacked and immediately healed by Malfurion. Kirsten is there. Didn't hit his rogue ability yet. Nice seven sided strike, but not good enough. The Maw was decent, and they're going for the kill against Terra and also against Karazim. Already the kill against Falstad. Stitches is down. Karazim is dying, and it looks like Tassadar might drop as well. It's at least going to be game, and this is a 2 0 victory in the best of three final here at the end of the Storm Qualifier for Europe. Well played by the Bubble Squad. They are victorious and take the tournament. Congratulations. And that is it, everybody. GG and well played. The game's over and therefore also the video for today here on Color TV. We had another great Heroes of the Storm match and I hope that you enjoyed it. Also hope that you enjoyed the commentary, of course. So thank you very much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the video, make sure that you give it a thumbs up on YouTube. And of course, if you haven't subscribed to Color TV yet, you should definitely hit that sub button as well. If you have some friends that like Heroes of the Storm, then definitely make sure that you show them the channel and also the video. There's a lot more where that came from. We're going to have like continuous content throughout the next few weeks with more Heroes of the Storm matches played, not only on the European server, but also on the North American server, in tournaments, in leagues, and more than that. So guys, once again, thank you very much for tuning in today. I hope that you had some fun. It was a pleasure casting for you. And I'm going to see you next time with even more videos here on the channel. So have a great day and see you soon. Bye-bye.